Good morning, church. This is going to be the last time we're pre-recording the service and setting it uh, at the time we've been having it, starting next week when we're gathering inside. We're going to go ahead and, and live stream the message when it's being preached. We're planning on doing that during our 10 o'clock service. Pay attention to your emails, the brief, uh, social media. We'll make sure you know when that's coming online and where to access that video on Sunday morning. Otherwise, I hope to see a lot of you back inside the building. Uh, we've moved the chairs around, we've spaced things out. We're excited to get back together. I, I wanna let you all know, uh, I I've always been kind of a, a see it for myself kind of a person. When I was younger, if you told me I couldn't do something, that meant that I was going to go do that thing you just said not to do. When, when I was uh, younger, if you told me something wasn't possible, that made me want to go out and try it. Knowing that there's a warning label makes me want to pull it right off the mattress and then go watch the window to see if the feds were on their way because they were watching me and saw that I pulled off the tag that says do not remove. I wasn't a very cautious person when I was younger. Uh, I would hear or read a warning, I would file it away, and then immediately do my best to defy that warning. I was told once that I would get hurt if I jumped off a second floor balcony. So I immediately proved that that statement was true. Jumping off a second story balcony hurts me. Uh, my high school guidance counselor told me one time that I wouldn't survive the military. I wouldn't even make it through training. So I went and signed up for the military. When Amy says the batteries on the TV remote control are dead, I don't take her word and go get batteries like a good husband. I take the remote and I point it at the TV and push the button. I hit the remote on my hand. I might drop it on the floor to see if it just needs to shake it up and push the button some more, take the batteries out, put them back in, try again, before I then go get batteries to put in the remote, believing that they're actually dead. Just kidding, I won't go get the batteries. That's why I have kids. I'll text the kids to bring me batteries from our drawer where we put the batteries. But as I grew up, as I matured, I learned that warnings can be super important and that I should pay attention to those warnings. I learned that doing that, paying attention to those warnings can help keep me safe and it'll give me my best chance at success in life. This is where we find Jesus and the disciples today. As we finish out Mark chapter 9, we're going to be going through verses 30 through 50 today. And Jesus is still working to explain to the disciples, to teach them, to get it through their heads who he is and what they'll need to succeed in carrying on the ministry that he started. Jesus knows that the time is drawing close. The window of time he has with him is getting smaller and smaller. And he has this urgency as he teaches them. And he gives them these warnings. He came to die for them, for us. He calls us to follow his example, to build up the kingdom of God as humble servants, to set aside our own pride and our own selfish desires, to get rid of those out of the way. And he calls us to be united in his name. We're called to work together with other believers to reach out to the lost with the gospel. He warns us of the consequences of bringing the attention to ourselves and taking it away from him. He tells us it's better to potentially wound our own pride rather than continue in a bad path of life and lead someone else astray. Let me say a prayer and we'll get into our passage today. God, I thank you again that we can come together. I thank you that we can uh, be gathering, whether we are in person, whether we are online, but to know that uh, the church, the body of believers, your people are one and we are united, God. And it is in your name that we can live the lives we live. Be with us today as we look through this, this portion of, of your story, God. Help us to understand what it meant for the disciples. Help us to understand what it means for us. Thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. We're going to start off with verses 30 through 32. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand the statement, and they were afraid to ask him. If you recall, Peter, James, and John, they were with Jesus on the mountain. They just witnessed his transfiguration where he began to glow and shine with his true godly glory. They, they saw him change right in front of them. They got to hang out for just a little bit with Elijah, with Moses. His glory, his very godness shining out. 
That was an exciting time for them. Then they came back down the mountain only to witness Jesus drive out this demon that their other co-disciple buddies who didn't go up on the mountain, didn't get to experience that. They weren't able to cast out this demon that Jesus casts out. And now the disciples, they continue on their travels with Jesus. They're traveling the region and, and trying to do so kind of incognito. They're trying to avoid the crowds still. He's still, Jesus is still feeling the pressures, uh, this urgency to teach the disciples what they needed from him in this rapidly shrinking time frame. They had seen his miracles. They had done some miracles themselves. They had heard his teaching. They heard him teach to the crowds as well as they heard his teaching to them specifically in a small group on a boat in the house. But for some reason, they weren't able to understand what it was he was trying to get through to them. They didn't understand really what his purpose was. They believed he was the Messiah. Peter confessed he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. They believed it, but they didn't understand what that meant. They didn't understand what had to happen for him to accomplish what he came to do as the Messiah. Remember, they, they wanted and expected this conquering hero to ride in with a sword, with a spear, and get rid of the oppressors. But he had been trying to tell them, and he does so here again, that he is not that. He's not here to conquer everybody. But rather, as he says, he has to be handed over, tortured, killed. But he's going to rise again in three days, and he's telling them this once again. This time, as he tries to explain this to them about what's going to happen to them, he adds this new detail. He says that he's going to be betrayed. This is huge. He hadn't given that detail before, and this should have caught the attention of the disciples. This should have maybe worried them a little bit that someone was going to betray them. Betrayal means someone will or is already deceiving him, deceiving them, maybe deceiving all of them. Someone is planning to greedily turn him over to his death for selfish gain. Someone, probably one of them, is going to betray Jesus. At this point, they didn't know who. But this still, this idea that someone was going to betray him and hand him over to the authorities just didn't sink in for the disciples. Let's read on and see what topic it was that they were discussing instead of letting this thing sink in. Let's read on verse 33 through 37. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed which, with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me but him who sent me. Mark tells us these guys were afraid to, to fess up, to admit to Jesus what it was they were talking about when they were too afraid to ask him to explain that bit he said about rising from the dead. You see, that concept, that idea, it doesn't happen. It's impossible for someone to be tortured, killed, and rise from the dead. But then as we read on, we see that they got distracted with that whole concept, distracted uh, by making plans for after he was dead because people can die. They needed to figure out who would be next in line to lead their scrappy group of misfits. You see, a teacher dying, particularly one who did the things Jesus did, one who said the things Jesus said, particularly one who was despised by the local leaders, the Pharisees, which the disciples knew he was, that's not unheard of. That's perfectly normal. It's sad. It's awful. But it wasn't something they wouldn't have expected to happen to Jesus based on all the other things that the Pharisees had tried to do, trying to trick him, trying to trap him. It wouldn't be unheard of. So as they meandered down the road, they were discussing among themselves who was going to be the greatest. Once Jesus is gone, that opens up kind of a power vacuum. Who gets to lead this group? It's an opportunity. Someone will be the successor. Jesus, of course, knew what they had been talking about on the way, and he tried to open a conversation with them to talk it through, to help them again understand what he's here for, really, because they can't be his successor. They can't continue on his work if they don't really understand what it is that he's doing. They were only thinking of the glory of leading this band, of, of being the focal point of all these crowds gathering. But he was talking about suffering. He gave them a warning, but they didn't get it. One time in college, some friends of mine read an article or saw a video or something like that about this thing called the Gallon Challenge. Uh, what they read was that it's impossible to drink a full gallon of milk in one hour and keep it down. So, after hearing that, 
it's impossible to drink a gallon of milk in an hour and keep it down. Of course, we went to the local grocery store and we bought some milk. We wanted to prove this was false with professionalism and using the scientific method, which we'd all heard about during our nap time in science class in high school. So we made sure that when we went to the store, we didn't just get 2% milk across the board or whatever. We had four different kinds of milk for the four of us. One of us had 2%, one of us had skim. One of the guys had whole milk and I, being the genius that I am, thought it'd be a great idea to go for a whole gallon of chocolate milk in one hour and keep it down. We started our timer, we set a clock, and we began drinking our designated gallon of milk, just a glass at a time. I was just going for the jug of why bother getting a glass dirty when the jug is perfectly fine, and I'm planning to finish the whole thing within that hour so no one else is gonna have to drink after me. Of course, over the course of that hour, what we did was proof that it is actually, for the four of us at least, impossible to drink a whole gallon of milk and keep it down. I didn't heed the warnings. We heard that it was impossible. We didn't believe those statements. We had to see it for ourselves, and we suffered the consequences. And I still don't really care for the taste of chocolate milk. So Jesus now, he, he sits the disciples down. They were hanging out in this house. They were still trying to avoid the crowds as Jesus is still trying to warn the disciples about what's going to come. They sit down and Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That, that doesn't sound normal. Imagine hearing him say this. If you want to be first, you're going to be last. I mean, if we're being super spiritual and speaking Christianese, we're familiar with that whole concept. But in the world, that's not normal. This first century Jewish culture, much like our own, was focused on achievement. He'd already told them something similar to this back in chapter 8, verse 35, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Again, that sounds contradictory. It sounds counterintuitive. But if you want to win what Jesus is saying, you can't be what we see as the winner. If you want to win, coming in last isn't typically part of our plans. It's not the way we think. If your goal is to save your own life, dying is nowhere on your to-do list. We don't think of typically taking the role of a servant when we're trying to fight the rat race and trying to come out on the top of our field. But Jesus doesn't do what we would do, thankfully. According to John chapter 13, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. He poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Jesus, the teacher, the healer, the Messiah, got down wrapped a towel around his waist, got a bowl of water, and began to wash the disciples' feet, the lowliest of lowly servants' jobs. The highest of the high stooped to the lowest of the low to set the example for them. And here in our passage, now Jesus is talking to them again, and he brings this child up to reinforce the lesson of what he's trying to tell them, to try to get this concept through to them, to let them know what he's trying to teach them. This kid that he brings up and, and stands next to him, sits on his lap, I don't know what the scene was, but this kid had no significance in their society. Kids didn't matter much in their society. The kid had no power. The kid had no status, no real rights or privileges. A child is vulnerable. A child is dependent on his or her parents. But this is the innocence. This is the humility that Jesus wants from us. If we want to be his disciple, remember, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. We have to be willing to serve with humility, even the lowliest, even the forgotten, even those whose society says are insignificant. Jesus, once again, is trying to explain and show the disciples in a way that they'll get a hold of and remember what is required of them what he wants from them, if they want to follow him. He's trying to warn them against going with the flow and being like everyone else around them. And he warned them of the consequences of blending in with our worldly culture around us. Let's read on verse 38 through 41. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. 
for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ. Truly, I say to you, he will not lose his reward. I imagine there was a little bit of awkward silence after Jesus brings a kid up in front of the disciples and says, be more like this kid. The kid walks back to his parents and no one really knows what to say. So naturally, to break the silence, John speaks up. This is the John, remember, who was with Jesus, James and Peter up on the mountain. He saw that transfiguration. He saw Jesus changed. He saw Elijah show up. He saw Moses show up. James and John, their brothers, their, their nickname was the Sons of Thunder, and he loudly proclaims here, John breaks the silence and says, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. He tells Jesus proudly, we saw some guy trying to do what you do and what you allowed us to do, and we stopped him because he is not a part of our super secret club that we've got going on here. But Jesus responds, he who is not against us is for us. This is huge, okay? This is huge. This is a lesson that we, the church, now need to read. This is a lesson that churches across the globe now need to understand what Jesus is telling his disciples right here about their attitude. Our attitude in the churches across denominations tends to be just like the disciples here. And Jesus corrects the disciples and tells them their attitude is wrong, their way of thinking is wrong. He tells them to stop it. He says, guys, we're on the same team. Right here in the Bible, right here in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus acknowledges that good can come from outside that small group of disciples that he had following him around. And that means that us, we as believers, even believers who don't come in this building, who don't agree on every little point with us, but believers, people who confess Jesus as Christ, believers who are working to deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow him, they're on our side because we are all on his side. The only thing that can stop the good that can come from believers working toward the same goal, from the church being the church as God intended it to be, is when believers, when we fail to see that we're working toward the same thing. Jesus not only warns the disciples here, but this warning that he gives them is for us. It's for the church still today. Let's read on the rest of the chapter, verse 42 through 50. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, and where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. It's interesting that the verse before this section Jesus promises this reward for unbelievers, for people outside that little circle who offer even the slightest kindness to Christians. In verse 41, we read a minute ago, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. But now, in the next verses, Christians have a promise of severe punishment for misleading someone, like the young child who Jesus just brought before them as an example sitting with Jesus to illustrate the lesson he's trying to teach them. Jesus uses a pretty drastic, dramatic illustration to show them how serious of an issue this is of leading someone astray. If you're going to represent Christ, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you do it for him, not for you. When you begin to influence people to look up to you and take the, the focus off of Jesus and, and teach them to follow and pursue you rather than follow and pursue Christ and his word, you're doing it wrong. You risk the faith that Jesus says is worse than drowning helplessly in the depths of the sea. If a part of your life is not setting an example that's going to help other people know Jesus better, to help other people know the truth of what he did on the cross, to let them know what that cross means for us, it's better for you to remove that part of your life completely than to risk going to hell. This is tough for us. 
Uh, I mentioned last week that we tend to remember only the parts of the Bible that, that talk about the good times, that talk about wealth and rewards and glory, and we forget the bits that ask us for sacrifice. We forget the bits that tell us we're going to suffer. But we can't lean on those good times. We can't lean on those good blessings and promises. We can't lean on the truth of heaven as a reward without understanding and fearing the reality of hell. Now, now, when Jesus talks about this, cutting off a hand, a foot, an eye, self-mutilation was prohibited in Judaism. Jesus wasn't literally instructing disciples to go off and chop off a hand or a foot. In fact, that's not a good idea for anyone. Don't do that. In that culture, though, maiming someone was thought to be better than death. Rather than a death sentence, someone might occasionally receive a sentence of losing a hand, losing a foot, losing an eye. In our faith, it's better to potentially wound our pride rather than continue on a bad path that leads someone else astray and causes us to go to hell. Jesus closes out this section with a, a couple of short thoughts. He says in verse 49, For everyone will be salted with fire. Just like Jesus is suffering, what he's going to endure leading up to and on the cross is going to pale in comparison to his glory in heaven. If us, if we as believers will endure persecution for him, it's going to be well worth whatever it is we have to go through here. That's hard to understand. That's hard to get a grasp on. That's hard to trust in when we're going through those hard times. But we have the church. We have one another. That's where our strength comes in one another to keep us on the right path, to keep us looking to Jesus, to know that he's, he's got this. If someone can't tell you're a believer, if they can't feel your saltiness, are you really salty? Jesus goes on in the next verse and says, Salt is good, but if salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Are you really a believer? If you are a believer, you're called to be at peace with one another. Jesus uses salt as an illustration here. This goes back to what we talked about earlier. We're on the same team. We're working toward the same goal, and not just us, those of us who call South Lake Christian Church our church home, call South Lake Christian Church our church family, but other churches who believe in Jesus as Savior and Messiah, we're on the same team. And why on earth would we fight and quarrel with one another? There's plenty more than enough evil out there attacking us at every turn. We should work together. There are plenty of people out there trying to discredit Christianity, trying to mock and ridicule people who call themselves Christians. We should work together. We need to be at peace with one another. Throughout this whole passage, Jesus is warning the disciples about their behavior, about their attitudes, warning them of the consequences that come with wandering off course, with losing sight of the goal, of becoming self-focused. I don't jump off of second-story balconies anymore. I don't even consider trying to drink a gallon of milk, let alone to do it in an hour and keep it down. I work hard now to heed the warnings of exceeding the speed limit, other warnings we have in our society. As we grow, as we mature, sometimes we learn from those mistakes because people around us pull us back in and help get us straightened out. We gain confidence in life and we gain confidence in our faith. We set aside our pride and, and set aside our concern for what the world thinks and focus on instead doing our best to carry on the ministry that Jesus started and passed on to his disciples who passed it on and passed it on. And now that mission is on us. Jesus came to die for them. Jesus came to die for us. He calls us to follow his example, to build up the kingdom of God as humble servants, not to seek the, the honor and the glory calls us to set aside our, our pride, to set aside our selfish desires. He calls us to be united with believers in his name and work together to reach the lost with the gospel. And he warns of the consequences of bringing the attention on ourselves instead of focusing attention on the cross. Jesus warned the disciples not, not to restrict them, not to be a, a, a dictator over them, but to give them their best chance, to give you and me our best chance at following him and living eternally for him. I pray that you, you've had a good week. I pray that you've gotten into the word and you've, you've seen the warnings Jesus gives the disciples and you see their attitude trying to see who's going to be the best 
and that you understand, as they will eventually, that Jesus is the best, and all we can do is bow down at his feet and work with every breath we have to serve him. I'll be praying for you guys, looking forward to coming back together at some point in the future as a, as a family, as a church, as a body of believers in the building God's blessed us with. But as always, let us know if there's any way we can be praying for you, any way we can be helping you and take care of you. Take care. Have a great week.